Hello everyone, uh, this is Jeff with Mississippi and the Civil War. And it is finally time for our July 4th uh, special episode. I know it's coming a little bit late, there were technical issues, but it is finally here. And I am going to be talking on civilian life in Mississippi during the Civil War. This was a topic chosen by Adam Bonilla, who won the contest and earned the right to pick the topic for this episode. And I'm glad Adam uh, won and that he picked this topic as it gives me a chance to uh, use a reminiscence that I've been wanting to uh, wanting to uh, feature on the channel for quite a while. And I've already done one episode on the home front uh, during the Civil War. It was back in October of 2021. If you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend viewing that episode. I will try to link it in this video. I'm not the most technically adept person, but I'll try. Uh, if I'm not able to do it, I'll, I'll put it in a message with the uh, with this episode. But uh, I am going to be talking today on a individual boy's reminiscence about growing up during the Civil War. And in 1903, Willis Plummer Chapman published a series of letters in the Brandon News entitled Home Side of War Times, in which he recounted his experiences uh, growing up on a farm in Rankin County, Mississippi uh, during the Civil War. And he, he said he did, did this series for a very specific reason, and he explained that in his introduction. He said, very much has been said and done to commemorate the noble service and brave deeds of the sons of the lost cause and to honor the veterans of the Confederacy. But to my mind, there is another side to this most interesting question, which has not been treated with the courtesy and respect it deserves. It is the home side of life in the war times or the hardship and sufferings of the home people during that fearful scourge of civil war. Mothers, boys and girls had their troubles and bore them heroically. This matter ought to be better understood by our young people today. In 12 short letters, the writer will try to give our young news readers an idea of the doings and bearings of the home people during the Confederate War, beginning at Fort Sumter, South Carolina in April 1861 and ending in the spring of 1865 at Appomattox, showing them something of the hardships and burdens of the helpless at home while father, son, husband, and sweetheart were camping in the open field. So Chapman wrote these 13 letters to the Brandon News, and one was published each week starting with the April 2nd, 1903 edition of the paper. And the topics were really quite varied and quite, uh, uh, quite detailed. Uh, starting with uh, the first letter, which was the introduction, he went on to talk about uh, uh, part two, parting with father, son, husband, and sweetheart. Part three, farming and living. Part four, doctors and remedies. Part five, churches and schools. Part six, Christmas and Santa Claus. Uh, part seven, costumes and fashions. Part eight, tanning leather and shoemaking. Part nine, middle day and charity service. Uh, part 10, spinning, weaving, and clothes making. Uh, part 11, time of fearful forebodings, past and bad news. Part 12, demoralizing effects of the war, songs and slang. And the last part, uh, part 13, marching armies and parole soldiers. So you can see this covers quite a quite a bit of ground. So uh, uh, we better get started. We got a lot of lot of ground to cover. But uh, before we get into the reminiscence as uh, itself, I want to give you a little bit of background on our writer. Uh, Willis P. Chapman's father uh, was Alan F. Chapman, who was born in Georgia about 1810. He moved to Rankin County in the early 1830s, soon met a lady and af uh, after arriving, and on March 18, 1832, Alan Chapman married Miss Eliza Ship, and the couple set out to build a life together in the wilderness that was Rankin County at that time. Uh, the county had only been formed in 1828, so this uh, Rankin County was still very much a frontier of wild, untamed land. Uh, the couple settled in a small community known as Cato, which you can see I have highlighted with a blue arrow there on the map, which was located approximately 18 miles southeast of Brandon near the Simpson County line. Uh, the couple prospered in their new home, uh, and by 1850 they had nine children living under their roof, seven boys and two girls. And there were two other children, a boy and a girl, who were not at home. Uh, they were the eldest, and they had probably already left the household to start their own families. 
and uh, among these, this huge brood of children was Willis Plummer Chapman, who had been born July 26, 1851. And you see in the illustration here, this is taken from a book uh, published in the, the 1830s, and it shows a home on the Pascagoula River in Mississippi circa 1835. And the, the Chapmans probably lived in a very similar home when they moved to Cato uh, in the 1830s. Now the, the Chapman family certainly prospered in Warren, in, or in Vic, Rankin County. In 1853, uh, Allen was able to purchase 39 acres from the federal government, and in 1859, he was able to buy an additional 78 acres. In fact, uh, shown here on, in the bottom corner is one of the receipts for some of the land he purchased from the United States government. Uh, on the 1860 United States Census, which is shown here for the Chapman family, uh, Allen Chapman reported to the census taker that he owned real estate valued at $1,000 and had a personal estate valued at $1,150. Uh, to put this in modern terms, in, in 2021 dollars, $1,000 in real estate uh, in 1860 is worth about $31,000 today. And a personal estate of about $1,150 $1 is about $35,000 in uh, 2021 dollars. So you can see the family was doing quite well for themselves in, in Rankin County. But uh, this prosperity was going to take a hit uh, with the coming of the Civil War. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was elected president in the 1860 national elections. Uh, the southern states immediately began to leave the Union, uh, with Mississippi being one of them, which they left the Union January 9, 1861. Then after the firing on Fort Sumter, April 12, 1861, uh, the war came. And uh, very soon the Confederate government began calling for volunteers. And in part two of his series, uh, Parting with Loved Ones, Willis Chapman explained the feelings of his community uh, about the start of the war and the prospect that their young men were going to have to go off and fight, including a lot of his, his older brothers. And Chapman said, The same time the bugle blast was heard all over the South, calling for volunteers, and the strength and flower of our country responded. Company after company was made up and drilled into service, and now when we heard the roaring of cannon and saw the armies in uniform with muskets burnished and bayonets flourished, we began to realize that war was a real thing. But the time came to part with our loved ones. We found it no time of rejoicing, but of sadness and sorrow. Father and husband leaving helpless wives and little children with no one to make them a support. Frequently, for you must know it was a rich man's quarrel and a poor man's fight, giving up dear brothers to march away to battle as sheep to the slaughter. Mothers parting with dear boys to never meet again on earth. You married women of a few days or weeks, taking the farewell kiss of parting, and to accept young widowhood, sweethearts taking the last look at their best love, and receiving the last token of assurance and the promise of faithful plight to be forever disappointed, and to have their earthly crown and hope to find a soldier's grave at Richmond, Franklin, Corinth, or Shiloh. Oh, how I remember those sad days of parting. No one except those who had the experience can tell of the broken hearts and lives that were there met with. The dove of peace had drooped his wings and flown to some faraway country where she could find rest. And for the Chapman family, uh, the anguish of parting with family members going off to fight in the conflict was very real. Uh, six of the sons of Alan and Eliza served in the conflict, but so far I've only been able to identify four of them. Uh, John, Charles, Thomas, and Jeremiah. Uh, all of the brothers served in Company F of the 4th Mississippi Cavalry, except for Thomas, who served in the 18th Mississippi Infantry. Additionally, Charles may have also served in the 39th Mississippi Infantry. I'm not entirely certain, but uh, in, by any means, the family certain, certainly had uh, uh, sent more than their fair share of family members to, to fight in the conflict. Now, in his third letter, uh, Chapman spoke on farming and living, and he started off uh, his article by telling about uh, the, the drought of 1860, which was very severe in the South. And he said uh, of this drought, the year 1860 has gone down into history as the driest year on record. Crops that year were almost an entire failure, and we had to buy corn from the North to make the crop of 1861. 
My father bought a hundred bushels through Daniel Wilkinson of Brandon, yellow corn to feed on. The year 1861 was a fine crop year, and the South made a big crop of cotton, as well as other products. But the, but the war coming on in the spring of the same year cut short the cotton market and left our crop on hand unsold. My father sold some and had a good lot ginned and put away to give the soldiers' wives and widows for spinning purposes. And then sending off so many uh, young people to fight in the war meant that a lot of the younger children who stayed at home had to step up and take on uh, more tasks around the farm. And uh, Willie Chapman uh, did note this in his letter. He said, My father was a Georgian by birth and a farmer by occupation. He had a family of eight boys and three girls, six boys and one son-in-law in the war, so myself and a brother one and a half years my senior were the plow boys, and you may emphasize the last two words in the sentence, while father and at times the girls used the hoe. His plan was to break all the land in February if possible, and in March the land was checked off in rows both ways, seed corn, two to four grains dropped in each cheek and uh, covered with two shovel furrows and boarded off. While the corn was uh, getting up and off, we had to break out what the old gentleman was pleased to call the banks, and then we had to plow the corn, first one way and then the other, until we gave it three genuine plowings. No one furrow system in this. Three solid plowings, and then it was hilled up with uh, the hose and laid by. I want to say that most any land will produce good corn under that kind of cultivation. During crop time, the man of the field did not allow much time for fishing and hunting, saying that if we did not make a crop during crop time, there was no use planting at all. Then we planted a big crop of potatoes. The land was well cultivated before the slips or draws were set out. Sometimes the little potatoes were cut into suitable pieces and dropped into the furrows and covered with a hoe. Potato digging was a time of great interest. We used the potato in a variety of ways for the table and stock. Potato bread and beer was a favorite way of using them. Then we baked and fried and stewed them. We also cultivated peas, rice, pumpkins, goobers, watermelons, and all kinds of garden vegetables. We made pumpkin bread by mixing boiled pumpkins with cornmeal and baking. And while it was not as sweet as might be, it had a beautiful bright color. We used for coffee okra, parched goobers, and meal brand, and in the spring of the year, sassafras tea, uh, heavenly dust or flour was a thing of the past, but we planted different kinds of small grains. Uh, the rye is next to wheat for good bread. But to go back to our living, as we planted no cotton, but, almost, but most all corn, we had lots of hog and hominy. Hog meat was plentiful, for where corn abounds, meat doth much more abound. Now hog killing day to our home meant something good to eat. The master of assemblies would on the day before have hauled a lot of good pine to heat the water and summons in a number of boys and arrange a long pole from one tree to another with a fork under either end and make a nice set of gambling sticks, etc. By the shank of the evening there would be hanging from 12 to 15 fat hogs, nicely dressed and on that long pole. The next day, however, was the great day of the feast. Spare ribs, brains, chitlings, and later came the souse. Boy, it sounds like quite a feast. And uh, unfortunately, as the war went on, uh, uh, big feasts like this were going to definitely become a thing of the past. Now, in his fourth letter, Chapman spoke of doctors and remedies of war times. And he said in this letter, when the war broke out, a great many of our best doctors enlisted as officers and soldiers and went to the front to meet the enemy. Others went out as army surgeons. This left the people to do as best they could for medical treatment. And as did everything else, we used substitutes and natural remedies. For chills, we used weed known as uh, bone set or uh, egg weed, as the Indians called it. It was extremely bitter, and when freely taken, if it did not set your bones, it would not fail to upset your stomach. Another remedy for chronic chills was to take iron scales from the shop anvil and rusty nails and put them into strong vinegar, and after the vinegar has eaten up the scales and rust, we drank the vinegar. Boy, that sounds like the, the 
cure may be worse than the disease. Uh, he went on to say, uh, kill the chills, do you say? Why, it would kill a turkey buzzard at long range. And I would not doubt that. Uh, next, for the children, we use the Jerusalem oak seed, which forms the basis for all the best worm oils on the market. Our good Confederate mothers would gather the seed when ripe and run them through a fine sifter and cook them in molasses and take it out in flat cakes. Then before breakfast, each brat had a slice served on him. This treatment was kept up for a number of days and terminated in a dose of abomination. And then he put in parentheses castor oil. For a gentle purge, there was nothing better than the May apple root. Its biblical name is mandrake. We would put the bark of dogwood, poplar, and wild cherry into cold water and let it stand a few days and drink it as a tonic. Water drank off of fresh tar was good for lung trouble. Willow and dogwood bark boiled down to the consistency of a gum was made into pills with a little copperus added and was taken to tone up the system in a general way. Sassafras was good for cleansing the blood and when mixed with sarsaparilla was an excellent substitute for coffee as well as a remedy. Uh, the oil of sassafras is good for rheumatism. I could extend this letter to greater length, but deem the above a sufficiency to give the idea of wartime remedies. However, before closing, I will mention the seven-year itch that made the rebels sore. It was an army relic and brought home to us by the soldiers on furlough or discharge. And when it got hold of you, there was trouble to the flesh and a ready demand for grease and sulfur. You have to grease nine days without changing clothes, and you may be assured that a gourd patch would have given off a smell more agreeable than your sulfuric lard mixture. And he's probably talking about the soldiers coming home infested with lice, because that was just a part and parcel of army life. And I'm sure when those guys came home, and I've read accounts of it, that uh, when they got home, the first thing their women folk did was make them strip down uh, naked in the yard and, and bathe them within an inch of their lives before they would let them anywhere near the house and take their clothes and either burn them or severely uh, boil them in water to try and get rid of the lice infestation. So I can only imagine what, uh, what that does to your skin after a while. It, ugh, it, must, have been, it must have been nasty. Now, letter number five uh, from Chapman concerned our churches and schools, and he opened with the following statement. He said, while the terrible storm cloud of war was raging over our heads and the billows rose higher and higher, threatening to engulf the great ocean steamer of life in the south, and the eddy key store of our hope had disappeared in the uh, uh, darkness of blackness, and assurance had become a mockery, and hope was borne away on the wings of despair, we still tried to look unto the hills from which we were taken, and to rest on the everlasting arms of the God of nations. We had left in our midst many faithful, consecrated ministers of the gospel, who did all in their power to counteract the evil influence incident to war times, and to point us to the Lamb of God, and to comfort the mourners of Zion, of whom there were a great number. You do not see much fluttering silk or towering headdress. The upper tens uh, had been reduced to minimum fives, and by upper tens, that mean, that was a slang term for someone the, of the upper class. Uh, the upper tens had been reduced to medium fives, and the silk stocking gentry realized that their coming poverty and all put on a look of wanting despair. The congregations were made up of old men and boys, faithful women, and loving girls. The strength and young manhood of our land was a thing of not to be seen. We had earnest preaching and good meetings, though sin and unrighteousness rose high in some quarters. And uh, uh, I haven't mentioned it, but uh, Chapman and his family were all Methodist. And so I included uh, a picture of uh, the doctrines and discipline of the Methodist Episcopal Church South uh, from 1854. And the picture is a modern picture of... Uh, the Methodist Church in Raymond, Mississippi, which if you've never seen it, I highly recommend going to view it. It was used as a hospital after the Battle of Raymond and is uh, said to still have bloodstains on the floor. It's, it's a beautiful building. Uh, and then Chapman went on to say, we had no Sunday schools to amount to much. Uh, the boys, uh, Negroes, and dogs monopolized Sunday for their own amusement in the country as a general way. We did not have such big meeting dinners then. It is true we had meat and bread, but we did things differently than to what we do now, though we had revivals and baptisms. 
The first baptism I remember took place in Campbell's Creek near Cato, and on the day I wore my first shirt uh, with wristbands and buttons in the sleeves and my straw hat and my homespun pantaloons, though barefooted, I measured up pretty well with the crowd, preacher, preacher not accepted, in my own imagination. Our family was at that time of the good old Methodist stock, and while my father was not excitable, he believed in good warm meetings and would vote for a good time. Sometimes we make special preparations by covering the church floor in pine, oat, or other straw before the meeting began. Then you might look for a double shuffle. Uh, the mourner's bench was a favorite instrument of warfare and fighting the devil in those days. And I have seen from one to uh, three thirds of the entire crowd kneeling at the altar. And when we got into a wavering way, leading out into a good meeting, a fellow would sometimes get a genuine, never to be forgotten, pounding from some other fellow whose religion was being revived. And uh, I included in a picture here, uh, a modern uh, picture of the shallow camp Methodist campground and the historical marker on the site. This is uh, probably the oldest Methodist campground in Rankin County, which was established in the 1830s, and it's still in use today. But uh, uh, Chapman and his family were probably very familiar with this meeting ground as it was very widely used during the Civil War period. And he went on to say, Again, we had no church organ and trained choirs in our services, but we had good music for all of that. Our preachers would line out those sweet old songs by Wesley, Watts, and others, and the people would sing them with the spirit, if not the understanding, and the volume of music would peal out like distant thunder. Our churches were not as plentiful then as now, but we did not think it beneath our dignity to walk from four to five miles to hear preaching. In fact, walking was the rule in plow time, and with this scribe, most all the time. Sometimes we would carry our shoes in hand till near the church and then slip them on and appear in the meeting as innocent as a suckling minnow. He really had a turn of phrase, Chapman did. <laughs> and then he went on to, to talk about schools and I uh, included as illustrations uh, the Little Red Schoolhouse in Richland, Holmes County. It was built in 1847-1848 uh, uh, and was the home of the Richland Literary Institute, uh, later renamed Eureka Masonic College. But uh, Chapman said of, uh, of uh, his schooling, during the war times our schools were good in many respects and while we did not study the higher branches, we did study the lower branches, including old field curriculum, uh, Webster's blueback and a blue, uh, black gum shalala. Our school teachers were mostly young ladies who had enjoyed good opportunities before the war. The average boy or girl during the war times had two seasons of schooling each year. The first term embraced all the time between laying by of crops and fodder pulling time till gathering uh, time. The second term, uh, all the time from fodder pulling time till gathering time, altogether from two to three months each year. They taught us Webster from back to back, abbreviations and all. They would occasionally give us extended explanation of things generally and a few things in particular, including a synopsis of anatomy, physiology, and sexual distinction that boys and girls played together under the watch care of a teacher. They played cat, bass, mumble peg, and various other little pastime games. And then Chapman closed by saying uh, that educational opportunities were very limited because, uh, as he said, poor boys and girls during the war had to work well nigh all the time at something in order to keep the wolf from the door. And that's, that's very true. Uh, they just didn't have a lot of free times. And you have to wonder about all the children uh, who missed out on an education for four years and they probably were never able to make it up uh, uh, afterwards. Now, in his sixth letter, uh, Chapman discussed customs and fashions. And I decided to use as the illustration uh, for this letter, the Monument to the Women of the Confederacy, uh, which is in Jackson, Mississippi, out in front of the, uh, the, the Capitol building. It's a beautiful monument. And so uh, in discussing customs and fashions, uh, Chapman said, you may always tell a people more or less by their costume and measure their common sense by the style and fashion by which they are governed. No Parisian belle could equal our rebel beauties in their native homespun. Far sweeter damsels, though furnished with rich plumed hats or costly gigaws, never looked from under headdress than Dixie's daughters 
in their indigo blue and diorock purple. Her genuine loveliness will show out from homely costumes. Our women wore shoes made from light leather taken from our home tan yards or from goat, coon, or possum hides. The soldier boys uh, made us combs and finger rings from cow horns and muscle shells and gutta percha buttons. The men and boys wore pantaloons, shirts, and all kinds of underwear. <clears throat> a boy to have pants and shirt properly checked with agreeable contrast in warp and filling and shirt made in soldier style with pockets in front was considered fixed up for business. We plated all kinds of straw and palmetto and hats for every day and Sunday wear. When finished with old calico lining and red band, we felt like a Rothschild or a Vanderbilt among the less favored, favored class of the vicinity. Our good mothers wore their homemade goods all around from bonnet to shoes. Our girls then, I mean country girls, I am not writing about city life, were stout and fresh and fine physiques. They knew nothing of corsets or fine sandals and oxfords, but let nature have a voice in their toilet exercises, and when they went to church could get a long breath without the risk of gagging or a fit of smothering and depression. The younger brats, male and female, wore dresses till four to six years old. This scribe can remember wearing dresses till he was well advanced toward boyhood and has the distinct recollection of some very sound thrashings for burning his petticoats and gowns. Little boys were not then put into pants and shoes before they could climb up the doorsteps and made to look more like bullfrogs than a president. And in his seventh letter, <coughs> Chapman wrote about uh, Christmas and Santa Claus. And uh, I use for this uh, illustration uh, one from uh, entitled uh, Christmas Eve by Thomas Nast, which was published in the January 1863 edition of Harper's Weekly. And uh, Chapman wrote about Christmas he, and he said, <coughs> Christmas in wartime came on the 25th of December as at all other times, but we did not have either heart or means to enjoy it as we do now. It is true we would burn some Confederate powder and shooting Christmas guns from old army muskets, but there was always one thought which cut us to the heart, that we were trying on hand for Christmas guns for amusement. We knew that guns of heavier caliber were throwing leaden missiles of death into the rank and file of our loved ones on the fearful field of battle. We could not think of Christmas for thinking of dead husbands, sons, brothers, and sweethearts. We had no Christmas trees laden with valuable gifts, from friends and admirers. We had no Christmas cards then with a few words of Christmas greetings. Uh, they did not come about much till the decade of 1870-1880. Our Christmas dinners consisted of bread and turnip, pies made from the ribs of straight uh, hog chicks, pumpkin bread, potatoes, rice, and Kershaws. Yes, Santa Claus, the old whiskered snow-capped chimney climber that he is, was cut off from most of his supplies and could visit us only in the limited way. He would bring us peanuts, potatoes, pumpkin bread, cornmeal, biscuits, hickory nuts, and pecans picked up with such other delicacies as he could command. He did not bring us boys' knives, wagons, guns, and such nice presents. Neither did he bring us nice dolls for the little girls. But he would make them Pauls and Virginias, Punch and Judy from old rags, and make their no nose, mouth, and eyes of suit stain on their heads. So it gives you an idea of just how much <coughs> improv imp improvisation went on during the war. Uh, just to make a Christmas uh, gift for a child, uh, you had to use the materials you had on hand, and, and they did. In his eighth letter, Chapman talked about tanning and shoemaking. And he said, uh, I will discuss a very skinny, hidebound subject. Skins, hides, leather shoemaking, and wartime tanning will be handled in a very promiscuous way generally. Uh, we had no improved tanning apparatus during the war, but did it by main force and natural awkwardness. We had no extra fine kips and kids of the best quality, but lots of homemade. We had no leather buffing machine better than our old drawing knife, no leather corrugating machine to flute or crimp 
with uh, no leather cutting or creasing fixtures, no leather grinder to reduce straps of leather to shreds to make washers, insoles, and heels. We had a Yankee in our boy in our community who could make fine boots and shoes for us. My brother-in-law made my sister a fine pair of possum skin shoes and lined them uh, with a heavy homespun. They were just splendid and for summer wear were just the thing to have. The finest pair of shoes this scribe owned during the war were made of coon leather by putting in strong stiffenings behind the coon uh, made an excellent shoe. For shoestrings, whip crackers, the cat hides took the lead. And in his ninth letter, uh, Chapman spoke about mill day and charity service. And uh, this illustration, this photograph, is a picture of Dunn's Fall uh, Grist Mill in Lauderdale County. And uh, this is a, a pre-Civil War uh, grist mill. It's not original to the site. There was one on the site during the Civil War, but this one was moved to the site some years ago from Georgia. But it is an original grist mill. But uh, in his ninth letter, uh, Chapman said, during the war, we didn't depend on the North for meat and cream meal. We took all they had to give us in powder and lead seasoned with Yankee cursing. The reason why Mill Day is indelibly stamped on my mind is I was so thoroughly disgusted with going to the mill, I had to go any time in the week and two or three times on Saturday, more or less certain. Of course, the poor widows and soldiers' wives needed meal, and notwithstanding a boy's earthly glory was wrapped up in a Saturday's evening fishing expedition, we had to visit that never-to-be-forgotten corn whacker, rain or shine, hot or cold, mad or pleased, and had it not been that we could swim in the mill dam a little, we should have died of heart trouble. <laughs> and then he went on to talk about uh, charity service, and he said, uh, I don't mean to insinuate that our dear destitute women were paupers. We took all the pains possible to keep them along and would plow their little crops while they would uh, take care of their children in the field and do their hoeing. We would stay with them at night for being alone uh, uh, was very difficult and uh, we cut and plied them with ash heaps to burn from which they obtained strong ashes and this was dripped and then uh, with lying grease uh, soap was a certainty. Wool and lit cotton were hard to procure during those days of trouble, but my father had a fine lot of cotton gin and gave it to the helpless, and it gives me great pleasure to bear testimony to his kindness after forty years have passed by and he sleeping in his grave. God will not forget his kindness to those broken-hearted and weeping Rachels of war times, and while all this was going on, uh, some of the Negro holders would sell corn to the widow's and soldier's wife at high price some I think as much as five dollars in Confederate. It was real hard to think our poor boys were in the war fighting to save uh, the Negro for the South and at the same time us little Rebs and uh, the Negro working for the rich. No one can appreciate the awful feeling of a wartime mother except those who, who know by experience. Husbands in the war, mill tub empty, meat out, no milk frequently, children sick, crop ruined for, uh, ruining for work, had to spin all day and sit up all night and nurse and knit, no strong arm to support, no husband to cheer, all disappointment and despair. And it, it really does make you think about just how much uh, was placed on the shoulders of the women folk of the South and uh, how they had to step up and, and manage these farms and, and they did it and did it well. Now, in his 10th letter, uh, Chapman wrote about spinning and weaving. And he said, <clears throat> Our dear good women uh, during wartime spun all day and part of the night. We had to spin for all clothes worn at home and for the boys in war. And it not, had it not been for the faithful souls at home, our boys would have gone as naked in the army frequently as a jaybird fresh from a Good Friday celebration. This scribe could break and card wool. We would pick the seed from the cotton. After supper, my mother would come in with her lap full of seed cotton, spread it before the fire to warm, as hot, cut, hot cotton picked best. Uh, some of the older ladies used what was called the spinning jenny. This is the name which Hargraves gave his spinning machine, which he invented in 1767. It was used to spin hemp and flax on. It consisted of a number of spindles turned by a common wheel or cylinder worked by hand. 
The spinning wheel of war times is too well known to need description. It consisted of a large wheel uh, band, bench, and a heel with a sharp spindle. We, wool and cotton was corded into rolls, which was drawn, twisted, and wound upon the head spindle and called a brooch. Of course, weaving followed spinning, and we made all kinds of textures, which no yank could ever in, imitate for beauty and durability. Thus we would weave mats, blankets, and many a poor boy slept on blankets his mother made and then was buried in it after the battle. All kinds of looms have been used, hand looms and power looms. Of course, we used the hand looms altogether, and a wartime loom consisted of the following parts. A frame, thread beam, cloth beam, breast beam, a battern, a treadle, a harness, harness rollers, a sleigh, temples, and a shuttle. Now, in his 11th letter, uh, Chapman spoke on times of fearful forebodings and bad news. And uh, he said, this should be the most interesting and sympathetic of the 13 letters I am giving you on the home side of war times, because it tells of the dreadful times when we stood with bated breath between the living and the dead. Not only did we have to meet and combat all the difficulties, trials, and hardships enumerated in the foregoing letters, but we lived in constant dread all the while. Every post or mail was sure to bring sad tidings to some sore and aching heart. Here is a post stating, Your son Warren was seen to go into the battle but heard from no more, not found on the battlefield fell with hundreds of others, no doubt, and found a common grave with them. Another post stating that your husband was left in a dying condition on the battlefield. Here came another son and brother with one leg missing. The family lift up their eyes, and lo and behold, the dead is alive and the lost is found. This cruel war filled our land with widows and orphan children, and to a great degree we ceased to smile over the cradle and wept over the tomb. The musical laugh of gleeful voices was turned into the cries of hunger and lonely service. Then think of thousands of bright boys and girls lost the accepted time for improvement. A gap of four years ruined many youths so far as a finished education is concerned, uh, the scribe included. And as illustrations I used here, uh, on the left are Mississippi graves near the bloody angle at the, on the Spotsylvania battlefield. And on the right, uh, this is a picture taken after the war of James A. Shelton of the 23rd Mississippi Infantry. And you can see uh, a crutch there in the, in the corner of the picture. Uh, he was wounded at the Battle of Franklin, Tennessee and had to have a leg amputated and uh, lived the rest of his life on crutches. And in letter 12, Chapman spoke of the demoralizing effects of war, songs, and slang. And he said, uh, the immediate demoralizing effect of the Civil War between the states was throwing out of balance nearly every wheel of Southern industry. The cultivation of cotton came to a sudden standstill for lack of a market and other things essential to producing to an advantage. Our money system was deranged. In fact, we had no money only in name. Think of salt bringing 55 to $60 a bushel, cotton cards 70 to $75 per pair, a common uh, pine straw hat, five to ten dollars. Homemade jeans, twenty dollars a yard. Shoes, ten to twenty dollars per pair. And uh, he's not kidding about those kinds of prices. They were very much the norm uh, during the uh, during the war, and uh, people were able to buy less and less with uh, with their Confederate, Confederate currency. They kept printing more and more uh, currency, unfortunately, and uh, it. Uh, uh, was worth less and less. So as the war went on, you could buy very little for your for your paper money. And then Chapman went on to state, another great demoralizing effect of war is the looseness of manner and habits contracted in early life, vulgarity, stealing, slang, etc., which was naturally the effect of home life more or less. It took 25 years to recover from the baneful influences of that four years war. I can only notice a little of the slang used during and after the war, and in some instances among the more vulgar is used yet. In fact, it has been too common in all the walks of life to set off our ideas with sparkling bits of wit and humor, amounting sometimes to slang, and intelligent people should have a pure idiom. 
And he goes on to mention some of these slang terms, and I, I just picked a few of my favorites. And I actually went uh, and did a word search of the, the Mississippi newspapers for the Civil War era, and I did find every, every single one of these uh, slang terms in use. And uh, the first one he, he, he talked about was, <coughs> excuse me, The first slang term he used was acknowledge the corn, which means to confess to. Uh, the second one was ball face, which means ordinary whiskey. Uh, the next one was not fit to carry the guts to a bear, which means worthless. Uh, the next one was cut dust, which means to run fast. Uh, the next one, which I really like, is dog my cat, which means petty swearing. And uh, the next one was flap doodle, which means utter nonsense. Uh, the next one was pull dick, pull devil, which means something in sharp contention. Uh, the next one was up salt river, which means defeated. And the last one uh, uh, was upper tens, which meant someone that was high class. And I really enjoyed those. Uh, it's, and it's interesting to, uh, that, uh, to see those. They were actually in use in Mississippi. Uh, during the wartime period and then he went on to, to talk a little just a little bit about songs and he said as for songs we had good bad and indifferent all kinds were composed by the soldiers in the army and carried home to be caught up by the boys and negroes and all over the farms up and down the roads all around the home could be heard dixie bonnie blue flag etc some of the songs were very feeling and truthful and that's really all he said about uh, about songs <laughs> But in his 13th and final letter, Chapman wrote about marching armies and parole soldiers. And uh, he started off by talking about the Siege of Vicksburg and, and, and some of the things he actually witnessed after the surrender and the paroled soldiers uh, passing by his home. And he said, uh, the Siege of Vicksburg lasted six weeks. And when Pemberton uh, found that he was not to receive reinforcements from General Johnston, he capitulated July 4, 1863 with 27,000 prisoners. The prisoners were paroled and sent east, and woe unto the country through which they passed. Think of 27,000 hungry soldiers turned loose on a hopeless country. The locust of Egypt was not a circumstance to them. They swept everything before them. The home where this scribe saw them pass Cato was literally stripped. We gave them to eat everything we could rake and scrape up. And they took every chicken, duck, turkey, goose, guinea, cow, hog, ham, beehives, and the green corn, fruit and vegetables to be found. In fact, everything a man could eat, wear, or ride. Many of them fell sick by the wayside from overeating and fatigue. We took them into our homes and cared for them the best we could. Some of them recovered and some died. Uh, there are now in the old Cato graveyard a long row of soldiers' graves, marking the last resting place of some sweet boy, husband, or brother. So things grew worse and worse for the rebels till the Confederacy collapsed at Appomattox in Virginia in 1865. Some of the soldiers got home in time to make a late corn crop, potatoes, etc. The farms had become dilapidated, uh, the ditches filled up, fences down, the briars had four years uh, the start, and things all out of gear generally. Thousands of men who had four years before filled our homes and churches were missing. Hundreds of widows and orphans left. Some of the widows married again. Most of them remained single and fought the wolf as best they could with their children to help and waited to meet their first love in the far beyond. And then Chapman closed his last letter with a message to the youth of his community. And he said to them, Now in conclusion, my dear young friends, let me bid you adieu hoping that you may be profited by my letters. God grant that you may never live to see such dark times as I have described in the foregoing letters. May you go onward and upward till success shall crown your young lives. And I think that was a good way to end it. But uh, uh, Chapman went on to have a very, uh, very uh, uh, prosperous life. He became a very well-respected Methodist minister in his community, and he pastored uh, numerous churches in Rankin County and then later in Newton County. Uh, he lived uh, to the, uh, a ripe old age, died in 1914, and 
is buried in uh, Newton County, Mississippi. But uh, I hope you enjoyed this uh, this reminiscence uh, by uh, Willis Chapman. It, I think it really it it's, it speaks to the the personal uh, effect that the war had on an, on an individual family, and uh, I, I really enjoyed it. And I hope you, you you enjoy it as well. If you like this episode, please give it a like and a thumbs up. And uh, I, I will have a new episode for you very shortly. But uh, thank you all for watching. <laughs>